This month, California officially became a state of refuge for transgender children in a law signed by Governor Gavin Newsom. Children and their families who are fleeing states where gender surgeries are banned are now protected from prosecution. Meantime, Virginia Democrats are pushing a bill that will allow minors access to medical procedures without parental consent. And joining us now in our studio is the former head of the American College of Pediatricians, Dr. Quinton Van Meter, and current director of the American College of Pediatricians, Dr. Jill Simons. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here. Dr. Van Meter, I want to start off with you. Uh, your reaction to these headlines coming out of California and, you know, are you surprised by all of this? I'm not surprised because it's California, where Governor Newsom has <laughs> tends to go off on the deep end often. But the the idea that uh, a child can come from a state where perhaps the laws in the state have been designed to protect them from the the harms that we knew those of us on the on the scientific evidence of medicine know happen to these children, uh, and so the family is torn apart. Uh, one parent takes their child undercover to California. The other parent is left back in the in their home state. Uh, help, you're helpless and unable to be part of the family. It rips the family asunder. Yeah, it's so dangerous on so many yeah. levels. I'm curious, why do you think there's such a push for this gender affirming care here in the United States when other countries like Sweden are kind of pulling back from it? Well, the European countries you mentioned are, are essentially 10 years ahead of us in terms of data. They've collected the data and they've analyzed it critically and realized there was no benefit whatsoever and some greater potential harm in doing these kinds of uh, affirmation or if you have so-called affirmation techniques on these children. Uh, and so they have ceased uh, all those activities and said the, the main thing that needs to happen is the counseling until the age of consent. There should be no intervention which allows that child to assume the persona of the opposite sex. So, Dr. Simons, I'm going to ask you, I'm not a doctor, so there's some things obviously I don't understand, but why wouldn't we follow Sweden's lead on this? Um, it's a good question, and that's an issue that the American College of Pediatricians is raising to um, let's pause, let's look at the science, let's look at the medical facts, um, and, and see what really is the best for these children. Yeah, you think you would sort of play it safe and, and follow, you know, the country that was sort of the lead on that. Dr. Van Meter, I want to go uh, back to you now. Can you talk to us, because you're an endocrinologist, can you talk to us about the medical and the psychological repercussions of some of these therapies on young people? How will it affect them? Well, even the social uh, aspect of just giving the child a new name and a new persona it immediately tears the child's uh, fabric of life apart. And it's hard to put that back together. They call that fully reversible, but the child is never seen the same by their peers, uh, by their parents, uh, by the extended family members. Uh, and then you go into the medical uh, issues and block puberty and get, use the wrong sex hormones in large amounts to sort of create a physical appearance of the opposite sex. And there are incredibly profound, deeply uh, uh, bothersome and well documented in scientific literature consequences of blocking puberty and, and all of the things that with the cross-sex hormones do. The surgery is the, is the end point where they are essentially completely sterilized. And you cannot expect a, an adolescent child to understand that there will be no sexual function, that they will not be able to procreate as, as a result of a decision they made when they were 13 or 14. The breasts are cut off. This is a mom who will maybe someday turn around and be, want to be that mom who wants to breastfeed and can't do it. It's, it's a tragedy. It really is. And, and having children, you know, many of us know that children change their minds all the time. Um, and it seems I've seen this dramatic spike in children who are gender dysphoric or saying that they're transgender, a lot of them girls. What do you think is leading to this, Dr. Simons? I think um, the social contagion aspect of it, um, teenage girls in particular want to fit, fit in with their friends. Um, and we talked about this just before we started, that puberty is a time of lots of changes and sometimes being unhappy with those changes. And so now instead of normalizing that as just part of growing up and um, accepting that and learning to appreciate your body, it's, it's, you know, discussed as well, you know, maybe you're transgender or, you know, giving it another name. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a shift in how we're treating normal puberty. Um, and what about doctors, you know, Catholic doctors in particular? Um, they're under a lot of pressure right now and going against their conscious rights when it comes to these type of procedures or gender-affirming care. Um, what can they do? Can you kind of talk about that push and pull? 
Sure. And, and that's why the American College of Pediatricians is here, um, as a place for pediatricians uh, to come as an alternative to the other medical organizations um, and um, be able to push back against this and, and practice what we really think is best for these children. Um, so we, our office receives multiple calls uh, and contacts a week uh, from pediatricians as well as from parents uh, reaching out to us looking for resources uh, as to what they can do to help these children. Yeah, it's very concerning and I wish we had more time, but thank you both so much for being here today um, to talk about this very important subject. We appreciate it. Thank you so much.